Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C A C H E F L Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. Uh, I was out of town on this Sunday, April 29th, so my good friend Scott Wilkinson filled in. It's going to be a great show. Episode 870. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by ShareFile. Enhance your workflow. Send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile. Brought to you by Citrix. Try ShareFile today. I have a great offer to get you started. A 30-day free trial plus get double storage. All you have to do, visit sharefile.com, click the radio microphone, and use my promo code TECHGUY. Well, hey, 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 welcome, and a good day to you. It's Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek and online editor of hometheater.com, filling in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Leo's away this weekend on a fabulous adventure, uh, photographing his little heart out in Norway, and uh, he is undoubtedly having a wonderful time. I'm quite envious, but you know what? I get the greatest consolation prize in the world. I get to sit here for three hours doing what I love best, which is talking about home theater. And uh, I hope you will join me in that conversation. There are a couple of ways to do it. You can, of course, call, and I hope you will, at 8888-ASK-LEO. And uh, that is, um, I'm going to have to call up what, uh, what that translates to in numbers because uh, I don't remember exactly, but uh, I'll tell you that in a minute. The other thing you can do, of course, is join our wonderful chat room, which uh, is humming right along here. Got about 600 people or so in there. It's well moderated. It's family friendly. Not at all a scary place, so uh, I do hope that you will uh, join in there because uh, I'm watching it as we go along, and any questions that I can't answer, somebody in the chat room probably can. So um, do go hang out in there if you can. You can get there through uh, the radio show website, which is techguylabs.com. So here we are on a lovely Sunday in Petaluma, it is a beautiful day out. Yesterday was the Butter and Egg Days Parade, and uh, today they're having some sort of um, antiques fair, so I'm going to go check that out later. But, you know, <laughs> somebody asked me not long ago, um, one of the differences between audio and video is that video, uh, audio products, people often shop for antique video products, speaking of antiques. Uh, they, they look for the old audio products uh, that are 20, 30 years old. But nobody looks for a 20 or 30 year old TV. <laughs> because the uh, technology has advanced so far that, uh, you know, your parents' old, uh, Vic, uh, old uh, Zenith, I was about to say Victrola, but that's not quite right. Um, your, uh, your parents' old uh, Zenith or Magnavox TV. You know, with standard definition, it was four by three, it was a tube TV, weighed about 500 pounds, uh, and, um, you know, people used to, to keep TVs for 20, 30 years very often. Uh, I remember in my household, we certainly did for a very long time, and these days you don't so much because the pace of innovation has picked up, as it has with so many things in our wonderful technological world. Um, but audio is a little different, you know. People still value the sound of tubes, for example. Uh, even if they don't measure uh, particularly accurately, they still impart a quality to the sound that is it, people really like and they really gravitate toward. In fact, that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about with my guest on tomorrow's edition of Home Theater Geeks my podcast show on Leo's Twit Network. Um, it records on Mondays from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. Pacific Time or 4.30 to 5.30 Eastern Time. And you can tune in at live.twit.tv and watch us record the show. 
Or you can pick it up afterwards as a podcast at iTunes or at twit.tv, on YouTube, and at my website, hometheater.com. Now, tomorrow, we're going to be talking, I'm going to be talking with Steve Guttenberg, not the actor, but the audiophile who uh, contributes to Home Theater Magazine and HomeTheater.com, as well as his own blog on CNET called Audiophiliac.com. And uh, he is going to be arguing that the process of measuring audio gear is not very important. And that what's more important is how well somebody likes a product. And certainly the subjective evaluation is very important. You have to buy what you like, which is the same for other antiques as well, and art and anything else. You, you need to buy what you like. Um, and, uh, and he's going to argue that measurements aren't so important. Whereas uh, he recently had a, a discussion about this, uh, shall we say, politely, uh, with Tyle Hertzens, the editor of one of our sibling sites called innerfidelity.com, which is uh, aimed at headphones and personal audio. And uh, Tyle, who is a very astute fellow and has been on my podcast also, he measures headphones inside a very expensive isolation chamber on a very expensive uh, dummy head with real ears that are modeled after human ears, and he takes a lot of measurements and um, finds them to be important. We, also at uh, hometheater.com, we measure all the audio equipment we review, although we don't reveal those measurements to the reviewer until after they've established their subjective impressions. We don't want those measurements to color what the reviewer thinks as they're evaluating the product uh, by listening to music or uh, soundtracks on uh, of movies and so on. So it's going to be a very interesting conversation, and I do hope th very much that you uh, will tune in to that. That is tomorrow from 1.30 to 2.30 Pacific or uh, 4.30 to 5.30 Eastern. Here's that number, by the way. Um, the phone number, which I mentioned earlier, 8888-ASK-LEO, it translates to 888-827-5536. So uh, I do hope that you give me a call or jump into the chat room and uh, let's talk about home theater. You know, Leo, of course, talks about all forms of technology, cell phones, camcorders, although not that much these days, camcorders are more digital cameras, uh, still cameras that happen to shoot video. Um... Computers, of course, lots of computers. Um, but, uh, you know, my specialty is home theater and all things AV, not only at the, in the home, but also uh, out uh, if you go out to the movies. Now, some people that I know don't even like to go out to the movies very much because they like their home theater. And in many ways, a, a good home theater can at least equal, if not uh, better, the performance of uh, going out to the movies. And in some cases, that's absolutely true. But I still like going out to the movies. Um, I like the social experience. I like the fact that the picture is very much bigger. Um, the sound is mixed a little differently because the speakers are much farther away. And, of course, you get to see the movie uh, before you can see it in your home theater, before it's released on Blu-ray or streaming on Netflix or whatever. So, uh, so I do not, uh, I in fact enjoy going to the movies, particu particularly for 3D, because um, 3D benefits from a much bigger screen. So uh, I, would, I would encourage you to go out to the movies. If you can find digital projection, I find that much superior to film projection. There are those who disagree with that as well, but... That's, uh, that's my preference. It's rock steady. You don't have those real change markers every 20 minutes in the upper right-hand corner. And uh, things just, uh, just look a lot smoother, a lot cleaner, a lot crisper to me. Got a couple of visitors in the studio today. I'm so happy to uh, welcome Bob and Alice Sanders. Saunders, pardon me. <laughs> I got it. I got it right. Oh, Rob? My, my apologies, yes. 
Ah, yes, they're sitting here um, in the studio. They've come to visit from Sacramento. Hi, and thank you so much for being here. And uh, we're going to continue right after this. I'm Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek, in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. You know, we're, uh, we're recording this show for the podcast as well as the radio show, and uh, I think Leo has a message for us from ShareFile. Back with more of Scott Wilkinson. I hope you're enjoying the tech guy. I, sorry I couldn't be here, but Norway called. I figured, hey, I've got Scott Wilkinson. I don't have to worry about that. He's going to take care of everything. But I would like to take a little time to talk to you uh, via the magic of radio about ShareFile.com. This is a really great solution to a very big problem in business. How often do we want to email files to clients or customers or colleagues um, over, you know, in the course of business? But there's always a hitch. First of all, big file sizes now often that you'll get a bounce back. And worst case, you don't get a bounce back, but the client didn't get it. Uh, also, in many businesses, you've got to keep this secure, probably most. You've got to keep this secure, confidential. You want to control the spreadsheet or the prop proposal that you're sending out. ShareFile lets you do all that. It's really a way of sharing files designed for business. It doesn't have that fly-by-night appearance that some of these guys do. It really works. It's very efficient. Uh, you send files of almost any size, access your files from any computer or mobile device. You really can enhance your workflow easily, securely with ShareFile. I want you to try it. I've got a great offer, a 30-day free trial. Plus, when you use my offer code TECHGUY, all one word, TECHGUY, you'll get uh, double storage, free, for 30 days. TECHGUY, go to ShareFile.com. It's from Citrix, so you know this is going to be well-designed. It's going to work right, and it's going to be secure. It's HIPAA compliant. Sharefile.com. Use the offer code Tech Guy for double storage. Now, I think, yes, back to Scott Wilkinson and more of the Tech Guy show. Scott? <laughs> Leave it to Kyle, the man spinning the tunes and scratching his little heart out. We were talking offline about the headphones that I'm wearing. Those of you who are watching the video stream uh, will see that I'm wearing. Uh, the not not the standard headphones that Leo usually wears. Um, these are from a company called PSB, which is well known for speakers. Paul Barton, hence the name of the company, is the speaker designer there and uh, a good friend and an excellent speaker designer. And he decided he wanted to have a pair of headphones that uh, were noise canceling headphones so that he could use them on the plane. And I always wear noise canceling headphones on the plane. And uh, so he sent me a pair to, uh, to check out, and I decided to use them on the show. I use them on the flight up here, and um, I usually use uh, Bose QuietComfort 15s. And I have, to st I have to tell you, I'm not a big fan of Bose products in general, but their noise-canceling headphones, in terms of their noise-canceling ability, are fabulous. Just great. And I have to say they even beat out these PSBs in terms of noise-canceling. But in terms of sound quality, when you're listening to music, the PSBs have it all over the Bose. They really do. Now, they're expensive. They're $400, which is very expensive. Uh, the Bose QuietComfort 15s are 300 bucks. So, you know, you're still talking a lot of money either way you go. And they're over-the-ear headphones, which I definitely recommend. I prefer. Um, but if you want really high-quality sound for music listening, the PSBs are phenomenal. And uh, I'm really happy. I'm really happy for them. So, um, in addition to Bob and Al uh, Rob, <laughs> I did it again. Darn, Rob and Alice Saunders here from Sacramento. We also have James Messer from Tallahassee, Florida. Wow, come clear across the country to hang with us in the studio today. Thank you so much for being here, and welcome. Um, uh, Rob and Alice were actually talking uh, uh, before the show about they might want to get, uh, uh, they were asking about speakers for a small room uh, in their house uh, to listen to music, uh, uh, listen to movies really, uh, on their computer and on a, a relatively big screen TV. And Stephen in Turlock, California has a similar question uh, regarding the solution that I suggested to them. Stephen, uh, hi, you're on the show. It's Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek. Welcome. Hi, Scott. I had a similar question when I heard that intro. I was like, hey, that's what I want to know. <laughs> do, you have, 
Do you have an idea, a suggestion for a low-cost sound bar? Yes. Um, we have just started reviewing sound bars on hometheater.com, and uh, we don't have a lot of experience yet, but I will say that the Vizio VHT215 uh, came out pretty good. It, uh, it's a single sound bar that, uh, at, at, for those who might not know, a sound bar is uh, basically a long, skinny speaker, several speakers within one cabinet that usually sits under a flat panel TV. Sometimes it has a subwoofer, a separate subwoofer connected with it, either by a wire or wirelessly, and that can be placed just about anywhere in the room. And uh, many of them uh, simulate surround sound. If you sit, particularly if you sit in a certain sweet spot, right? And when you do, they use all sorts of uh, psychoacoustical trickery to uh, fool your brain into thinking that you've got speakers at least to the sides of you, or at least outside of the physical confines of the uh, of the box itself. So um, that is, and the Vizio does that. Most of them do, and uh, so that uh, I don't remember what the cost is. I'd have to I'll have to go look that up. I'll I'll look that up and say it on the show a little bit later. But uh, it's a couple hundred bucks, something like that. It's not, not too bad. So uh, of the ones we've done so far in the low-cost range, that's the one that I would recommend. Then I have one other question. that You had mentioned a product about a year, a year ago after going to Vegas with Leo mm -hmm. about speakers that were quite tinny, but then they were cheap, and then you flip this one switch, the switch and synchronize them all, and it became great. Hmm. And I'm to remember what you were talking about. It was like over a year ago, I think. Well, you know, and my... They, uh, worked my out, they worked out then. Well, you know, my brain is kind of a FIFO buffer, right? First in, first out. And uh, and so a year ago is a long time ago. I <laughs> I don't remember that particular thing. Um, I will say, in terms of low cost speakers, let me just let me just answer your answer the question about low cost speakers. Um, my favorites, by far, by far, come from Pioneer. Uh, they are the um, uh, they they are called the SP dash BS. 21 and 41. Uh, they are kind of boxy. They're not exactly svelte, shall we say. But uh, they you can buy a 5.1 system with the 41s in the front and the 21s in the back for like 528 bucks, including a subwoofer. Um, and it sounds... Oh, That'd be a lot better than the sound bar? It would. If you have the room for it, no sound bar can replace a true surround system. And that is really what you want if you want to get involved in the movie. Um, all movies on Blu-ray certainly are mixed with at least 5.1 channels, Some more and more these days 7.1 channels. And uh, if you have the real speakers around you, you get much more of the immersion, much more of the immersive experience that uh, the movie is intended to provide. So unless you're really limited on space, um, in which case a sound bar is an adequate substitution, it's certainly much better than listening to the speakers in the TV itself, which are never any good, never. So uh, if, you, if you don't have the room for a true surround system, get a sound bar. If you do have room for uh, surround speakers, that's going to provide a much better experience. Thank you very much. My, my question. Thanks. Thank you so much for calling. Really appreciate it. Let's go to uh, Dan in Van Nuys. Uh, hi, Dan. Uh, hi, you're on, Dan. With, you're uh, on with Scott, uh, Wilkinson, Scott Wilkinson, Wilkinson, the home the theater, home geek. theater geek. Hi, Scott. How are you? I'm what great. You Thanks. How can I help you? Yes, uh, we often talk about uh, how far from a, uh, uh, a flat screen we should be. Uh, I was wondering about the height. Is there a proper height? Uh, oh, good question. Flat screen? You, bet. you bet. That's a great, That's question. great question. I get this question, get this question all, all the time all from the people, time people who want to mount, to mount their flat, flat screen flat over, the over the fireplace. Right? And right. I always, right. say, I always say, don't do it. You'll don't kill don't yourself. <laughs> Actually, you won't kill yourself, but you'll give yourself a pain in the neck, literally. Right. Because you're looking up at the display. 
Exactly. Um, so, so the best place to mount, to mount uh, uh, any, TV, any, TV, any TV, any display, display is, is such that such is so that, that your your eyes your are level are with, level the, center with the, center the center of the screen. Of the screen. That's, okay. And that's that, at, that's at your seated that's height, where you're where you're going to be sitting to watch the TV. The, TV. the, ideal, the height ideal height is whatever your whatever seated, seated eye height, eye height is. is. I see. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes that's sometimes easy, that's and sometimes easy, it's not. not. Uh, and you know, uh, some and little variation above or below that's, below that's okay. But okay. whatever you do, whatever don't you put do, it don't above the fireplace. This is Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek, in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Okay, well, as those of you who are watching the podcast know, this is a podcast, in addition to being a radio show. And uh, we have a couple of sponsors of the podcast that we would like to thank very much. Uh, This episode of The Tech Guy Show is brought to you by Ford, among others, featuring available voice-activated Sync App Link. Sync App Link enables you to control select mobile apps from your smartphone with simple voice commands, helping you keep your hands on the wheel and your eyes on the road. Very important. With Sync App Link, you can voice control apps from Pandora, Stitcher, OpenBreak, Slacker Radio, iHeart Radio, and NPR in your car. I could sure use that. Take advantage of the new apps and features, including Sync Destinations. Get access to navigation and directions through your compatible smartphone. NPR gets the latest breaking news and plays your favorite NPR programs. And iHeart Radio Thumbplay Service uses simple voice commands to let you find your saved stations, skip to the next song, even give a song a thumbs up. Sync App Link is built on an API platform enabling Ford and app developers to bring in-vehicle voice control to more apps without you having to update the App Link software in the vehicle. Ford has a Sync mobile application developer network that enables developers to contact Ford about their app ideas, allowing Ford to bring them to you faster. You can expect to see more sync enabled mobile apps that you that you can expect to see more sync enabled mobile apps that can go along for the ride in Ford vehicles. Learn more about Sync App Link and other technologies at Ford.com slash technology. And we sure thank Ford so much for their support of the Tech Guy podcast. Welcome back. It's Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek, filling in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. And that music right there is uh, some of the music for Uncharted 3, I believe. Our next guest is going to be able to verify that for me. He's Greg Edmondson, the composer of that music uh, for Uncharted, for several of the Uncharted video games, as well as for Firefly, one of my favorite TV series of all time. And... uh, for quite a few of the episodes of King of the Hill. Greg, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, and good day, sir. Thank you. I had the honor and privilege of uh, playing um, some sounds for one of those Uncharted games, and, uh, you know, some, um, I think, didgeridoo and seashell trumpet and all kinds of horn-type sounds, and that was a lot of fun. I, I just had a great time. And then Leo and I were very lucky to be able to come visit you at Skywalker Sound, where you were recording the soundtrack for, was it Uncharted 2? It was Uncharted 2, mm-hmm. exactly. <clears throat> so um, so you have uh, made quite a career out of uh, recording music for TV and video games. More video games these days, right? You know what? I, I, I made a decision after Firefly. I was still doing King of the Hill, but I was lucky enough to get started on the Uncharted series. And at this point in time, video games give you resources that you would never have on, in, in television, mm. and you would only have on a major feature film. They hire you a large orchestra yeah. and, and give you the time to do something special. So when, it, when that opportunity presented itself, I went in that direction. So I've focused on the video games and, and, and mixed other projects in around them, but I'm so thrilled to be part of the Uncharted franchise. Oh, yeah. I guess partly the reason that uh, video games might might be able to offer you greater resources, bigger orchestras, and more time to do things, is that uh, the video game business is actually much larger even than the than the movie and TV business, isn't it? In many ways, they make more money off the video games than, the, than they do off of a film. Yeah. Absolutely true. 
Yeah, exactly right. And then most recently, you, you told me about when we were talking about uh, you being on the show that uh, you recorded something at Abbey Road. That was uh, Uncharted 3. Oh, which is what we just heard. That, that was exactly right. Yeah. How thrilling How thrilling that was. Oh, I mean, man. As you know from playing in an orchestra, and I'm glad you brought up your contributions because I was going to mention them as well. Oh, thanks. We also had the shofar and the Tibetan horn, if you recall. That's right. That's played. right. Uh-huh. <laughs> that was really fun. But it's such a joy to be on the stage with 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 musicians like that, and it, what that kind of helps to bring humanity to a game. Mm. I think one of the things that's really interesting about video games right now is there cha- every, the iteration changes every time you do a game, there because the game engine changes. Mm. We all know how to make a film, and we all know how to make a TV show. The technology that changes is you know you may have new cameras and be shooting digitally and not on film. Right. It's the game engine in video games that changes every time. So now the characters can do things they could not do before. Mm. You can capture human things. And it, it, in, in a weird way, they're becoming more and more capable of emotion hmm. than they ever were before. Yeah. Well, I suppose so, that might be because of the fact that the processing power increases very rapidly. And so by the time a new game comes out, you have greater computer power in, in which to, to do more things than you could before. That is part of it, and part of it is the process. I'll give you an example. The way they, the way at least they do Uncharted now is they bring the actors on the stage, and they put them in a mocap suit, which stands for motion capture, mm-hmm. has all the little balls on it. So the actor's actually doing the physical act that they're supposed to be doing in the game. If mm. he's supposed to be running with a gun, well, he's running with the gun, and the cameras are capturing mm-hmm. all, all, all that motion. But they also have a sound man with a boom. So while he's delivering his dialogue, he's delivering it as he's running. It didn't used to be that way. Mm. Used to they, they you know, it, in in the early days they would draw the character, and then bring the actor in to, and do it as an ADR line. Right. Which means the actor was just standing in front of a microphone, not doing anything. Now they are capturing, the the, the dialogue as the actor actually does it, and so it makes it feel real. So. You know, more and more, the games are just becoming capable of real emotion in addition to everything else that they could always do. Yeah. Now, there's one question I really wanted to ask that I, I still don't quite understand. With a movie or a TV show, it's linear, right? You you compose the music from beginning to end. But with a game, there could, there could be many different branching possibilities, right? You could go off in this direction or you could go off in that direction. How do you handle that with the music? Because seems to me that the music would have to follow those that branching and uh, how do you make that so seamless there's a there is a whole another creative element to games which is implementing the music into the game which is just what you just talked about mm. but when i write they will give me you know a, a little scene and say it's going to look something like this but of course you know in an interactive situation it, it, it's all changeable because it depends on what the player does. Right. He may choose to go in guns blazing or he may choose to kind of stealth in and you have to be prepared for all those possibilities. And I must say that I'm, you know, making, put it, making and implementing the music into a game is a team effort. Mm. And, and this, the Sony team that I work with, it spends so many countless hours taking the music that I wrote and implementing it in interesting ways into the game. And sometimes music that you wrote for one section when all is said and done, you may find out it works as well or better in another section. Hmm. The main thing for me is you want to keep it from sounding like like it's looping, which was how m- music had to be in the old days. Yeah, in the you old days of early video games. Come around. Yeah, sure. And and that kind of det- I found detracting, you know, from the experience. So again, as the game engine becomes more powerful, they can literally cut from one cue to another so that it doesn't feel like it's looping. Even if you come back to the original queue, you've broken it up by, with something different. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, the, it, I guess the, you're right. The, uh, the fact that you've got more power uh, in the computing engine or the game engine uh, allows you to, to do more of that than you were able to as well. True. Um, I got a bunch of people in the chat room asking about Firefly. You know, that uh. was... <sighs> So many of us are so sad that that did not last more than one season. And, uh, you know, there's there's all sorts of uh, talk about wanting to bring it back and so on. And and your music was just wonderful. Um, a couple people in the chat were asking about how you combined the acoustic guitar and the kind of twangy Western sound with the synthesizer type 
type sounds. How did you manage to integrate those? I, I, I wish I could think of a clever answer. I mean, <laughs> the, the, the original the re original vision was Joss Whedon's. Right. He wanted to do a space show that was the anti space show. So where in in Star Trek you'd have if you if you had a shot of the ship in space it'd be bum 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 you know that kind of stuff with right. French horns. Joss's idea was hey what if we did it with dobro and fiddle mm -hmm. and just something that's but it wasn't really that it was a western. It really wasn't a western. It was just a post apocalyptic show that kind of harkened back to to the the origins of our country. Mm. You know so that at some you know at some point in time if you were a rockefeller living in new york your life was very very different than if you were staking a claim in missouri mm. so in wow. joss's world depending on your circumstances anything made sense you could have laser guns you could have six shooters mm. it all depended on your station in life and and he had created what he knew to be the perfect television show and when i got that gig and they gave me the 2 hour pilot i said i'm working for 10 years 10 years uh, without even looking back. Uh, and and I look a little did I know it was going to be closer to 10 episodes. Yeah. I but I still think that was one of the best shows ever created. He had nine characters with wildly divergent past. Yep. It could have gone so many ways without ever repeating itself. Oh, absolutely. It was a great ensemble. Each character was was wonderful. I have to tell you also that you used one thing, one element in that soundtrack. And we're almost out of time here, but that big gong bell thing. That, that you used in that soundtrack over and over again, and I never got tired of it. I want to thank you so much, Greg Edmondson, for being a guest on the show. This is Thanks Scott, for having me. You bet. This is Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek, in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's Scott Wilkinson here, home theater geek, sitting in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. The music you're hearing, that opening little call, is a seashell trumpet. Um, in fact, here comes again. Thank you so much, Kyle. This is, uh, this is a piece called uh, Call of the Sea, uh, I think. Anyway, it's uh, some music that my friend Jeff Rona wrote for the Beijing Olympics, some of the uh, water sport competitions, uh, sailing, uh, I think, um, uh, he wrote some, some music for that and uh, called upon me to play the seashell trumpet, um, which uh, I was very happy to do. And, uh, and there it is. It's uh, something I also played on Uncharted 2. So if you're a fan of Uncharted 2 and you play that, you might very well hear my seashell trumpet call uh, on that, which, as uh, Greg Edmondson just said in our little interview, uh, I also played uh, the didgeridoo, the Tibetan trumpet, Tibetan big big trumpet, uh, the shofar, the Jewish ritual ram's horn trumpet, and uh, some other things. So uh, so that was great. I was really happy to uh, to hear uh, Greg Edmondson talk about composing for video games and also a little bit of uh, anecdotal stuff from Firefly, one of my favorite. Uh, TV series of all time. Let's go back to the phones. I'm going to talk to Gary in Santa Monica. Hey, Gary, welcome to the show. Hey. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. I'm going to take you back to this um, vintage idea, to some degree, mm -hmm. about video, uh, DVD servers. Mm. I have a client who originally had, I think you may have heard of this, an iMuse Sierra 2. I vaguely remember that name. A Denver company that must have, according to what I can find on the web, been in business two or three years mm -hmm. and just disappeared. Yeah. But anyway, they re that stuff is in the basement, and now they've replaced it with Kaleidoscape, a mm -hmm. more popular <laughs> but very expensive very. DVD server. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and they're moving out of this home, and they don't need it in the new home. And there's an expectation that the new owner won't want it either. So what do you suggest one does with very high-end audio video equipment like this well there's always ebay <laughs> i know i've looked and to be honest it's rare to see it there yeah, um, yeah. there's another website we talked about la yesterday called audiogon.com uh -huh. uh, that's a, a site on which people um buy and sell used audio mostly um, okay. So this is this would be a little off the beaten track for that because it's because uh, it's video, 
The uh, the other problem, though, is that Kaleidoscape is still in some legal hot water about uh, serving DVDs over a network. Um, Correct. I believe. I believe. Um, I just saw an email about that a couple of weeks ago, and I'm sorry, I probably won't be able to put my hands on it right away, that, uh, that, that they were ruled against. Um, right, but there's, oh, they, right, I understand there's appeals and there's things that keep this, just like Apple keeps going up against so many yes. of their competitors and they can <laughs> stay in the courts for years. Um, exactly but, right. You know, these, these servers are filled with hundreds of movies that, of course, you know, have to stay with the owner, mm-hmm. and Kaleidoscape said, of course, just erase them or take the drives out yeah, and then yeah. see what the market bears. I mean, but this is not a popular... I mean, I'm lucky. I know five homes that have this installed, but I believe it's a kind of 50000 to $250,000 service. It's a very expensive uh, system, absolutely very expensive. So Cal Ray Jr. in the chat room... Um, says that there's a sister site, videogone.com, for video gear. So so I didn't know about that. So that's going to be a, a good place to go. Okay. It's V-I-D-E-O-G-O-N.com uh, for, uh, for video gear. And, okay, uh, great. I'll give that a try because it's good equipment. It should go to somebody who, who would use it. Yep, yep, absolutely. All right. Appreciate your help. Sure, my pleasure. Thanks so much for calling. Bye. Okay, I'm going to go to uh, Andy in San Bernardino. It's Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek, in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, nice to meet you, too. How can I help you? Yeah, I had a question about... I just want to use a receiver. Uh, like 50% of the time, and for listening to music, two channels, and then the other... Uh, the rest of the time for surround sound. But I was wondering if it would be, I was looking at some older receivers online, mm-hmm. you know, about 10 years old, mm. and I'm wondering, would I miss out much if I uh, get a receiver that didn't have HDMI? Well, do you have any source devices that have HDMI outputs? Um, no, not really, but I, was, I mean, I was planning to get like the Blu-ray and... Sure. Uh, I wouldn't if I were you. Yeah. I would recommend against that. Um because if you're planning to get a Blu-ray player, which I certainly would recommend, if you're going to watch movies, that's the way to do it. The best way to do it. Not the only way, but it's the best way. And, um, uh, you know, you, if you start off with a 10-year-old product that doesn't do a lot of stuff, another thing that that old receiver wouldn't do is uh, be able to decode or accept um, the new lossless audio codex, coder mm-hmm. decoders. Uh, DTS and Dolby both have... Uh, very high quality audio formats, which uh, an older receiver would not be able to deal with. So um, that's another reason to to get a new one. And you know what? New receivers, we've we've found some really good ones for under five hundred bucks. So cool. it's it's not a big expensive thing to necessarily do. Uh, the the um, Denons, the the lower end Denons um, and Onkyos are are really quite good, and they have yeah, the I was HD. Looking at that. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was looking at that. What is it? The thirteen twelve. Thirteen twelve. Yeah, I'd probably go a little higher than that. What's your budget? Is one question certainly. Um, probably for a receiver around maybe three hundred mm-hmm. around there. Mm-hmm. Um. <clears throat> 1312 might be might be a little much. Uh, David Vaughn was on yesterday, and he was telling us he's reviewing an Onkyo that's in the three maybe three hundred and fifty dollar range. I'll have to uh, I'll have to remember what what model that was. Uh, keep listening to the show, and I'll I'll find that out and and say it out a little bit later. Um, but it was uh, I think it was an Onkyo. And that would certainly yeah, be the ones a five year extended warranty. <laughs> yeah, well, they did have some problems. They did have some reliability yeah. <laughs> issues, which apparently they've solved. And they took care of business by extending the warranty of the products that, that were already out in the field. So kudos to them for sure. Yeah. Well, so that's I would what I would do. just one more question if I have time. Sure, yeah, go ahead. It, well, would it be good to get an older uh receiver or uh, amplifier just for T channel? Or I don't. I don't see why you can do two channel just as well with a with a newer multi channel receiver. 
just use two channels. Unless you know. unless you want to put it in a different room, you know, if you want to have like a two channel listening system versus a multi channel listening system for your uh, movies and stuff, then sure, an older older receiver might might be fine. But if you only have one system, then uh, I, I, you can listen to two channel just as well with a multi channel receiver. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You answered all my questions. <laughs> Good deal. Thank you so much for calling. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. You're doing a fantastic job. Oh, thank you so much. I really appre- <laughs> I love it. I really appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Thank you. See ya. Okay. okay. I got some stuff in the chat room here. Uh, David Bix is saying Pioneer regularly has a good one at Newegg for 180 bucks, 150 on sale. Razlak says the Onkyo TX SR313 is 299 MSRP. Um, Lazy Guru is talking about Denon refurbished products. That might be uh, another way to go. Uh, so uh, there are many options there for uh, receivers that uh, won't cost you a lot but have what you need, which really is HDMI inputs and uh, the new audio format decoding, um, which now virtually all of them do. And they also all virtually all pass 3D. If you're interested in 3D, you want a receiver that will take 3D from a 3D Blu-ray player or a 3D uh, set-top box, a broadcast set-top box uh, from 40 seconds. the channels that do that and uh, pass those along to to the TV or the display. So, um, you know, you don't have to spend a lot for, for a reasonably good receiver. And then you don't have to spend a lot for speakers either. We were talking about that earlier uh, this hour that uh, the Pioneer uh, 21 and 41 speakers, uh, 500 bucks for a 5.1 surround system. Uh, you know, you're into your sound system then for well under a thousand bucks. You can get a good uh, TV for thousand bucks or so, and you got yourself a home theater. This is Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek, sitting in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy, back after this. Well, hello there. Welcome. Come on in. The tech is fine. This is Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek and online editor of hometheater.com, filling in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy, who you might have been expecting today, but uh, no, he's in Norway, having a wonderful photographic adventure that I'm sure we'll hear all about next week. But meanwhile, I'm here to talk about home theater and audio video even going out to the movies, anything to do with audio and video, then uh, I love to talk about it. Big screen TV, surround sound, Blu-ray, AV receivers, all that kind of stuff. All the stuff that really is the modern means of storytelling. Last night uh, we went out to a live play, and that's a totally different kettle of fish. But uh, when you don't have the opportunity to do that, the, uh, really the technology involved in storytelling has evolved so much over the last 10 years that, uh, that it's really quite astonishing and quite wonderful to have a situation in your home where you have a big screen TV, you've got speakers surrounding you, um, and uh, you can pause it when you need to. <laughs> um, and uh, and it really can be a very engaging, involving experience. And I'm here to help you get the most out of whatever system you have. Not everybody has a dedicated home theater, of course. Um, if you have a TV in your living room, if you have uh, just a couple of speakers, uh, whatever you have, there are ways to get the most out of it, and that's really what I'm dedicated to doing. Um, yesterday in the chat room, uh, there was a, a fellow who, or someone, it's hard to tell the gender of who's in the chat room by their chat room names, but in any event, someone in the chat room um, was uh, commenting that, you know, gee, I guess this is a show for people who already know all about this stuff, and uh, if I don't know anything about it, uh, how can I possibly join in? Well, I, I hope you do join in, because uh, in my world, as far as I'm concerned, there is no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, if you don't know something, you don't know it, and I'm here to help you learn more. Now, of course, I've got to answer the questions that I'm asked more or less at the level that they are asked, but 
I, w- I do want to encourage you and invite you to give me a call at 8888-ASK-LEO, which is 888-827-5536, or come on into the chat room, which, uh, in which there are about 700 people right now. These are the smart kids, kids in the back of the house, back of the room, I should say. Um, but, they're the, but they're the cool kids, too. They, they really are very nice, very knowledgeable, and uh, not intimidating. And we, we have a bunch of great moderators uh, in the chat room to make sure it stays family-friendly and to make sure it stays non-intimidating because uh, I do want to be very inclusive. I want to make sure that everybody knows that they are welcome to come in If you don't know something, join the rest of the crowd because not everybody, no one knows everything, not even me. And when I don't know something, I turn to the chat room because somebody in there probably does. Or if not, I'll do some research and find out the answer. So I do not want you to be frightened of coming in or intimidated for uh, to ask a question. All questions are fair game, and uh, I will certainly do my darndest to illuminate uh, your question, provide you the information you need to get the most out of what you have or to buy what you really need without spending too much money and uh, perhaps fix a problem that you might be having. We've got a bunch of callers on the line. I'm going to just go right back into it here. In fact, I've got a musician on the line, and i got to go to him, Joe in Thomasville, Georgia. Uh, hey, Scott, it's very good. Very pleasurable to talk with you. You remind me of an old friend that I used to have back in the 70s, and we would spend hours and hours just messing around with old audio stuff and talking about it. Yeah. And it's, a, it's just a, it's, it's a pleasure to talk with you. Well, thank you so much. I'm really glad you gave a call. And uh, you're a bass player, huh? I am a bass player. And my first question, and if I have time for a, a little one after that, I'll hit you with it. But my first question is, I just bought a new bass amp about uh, three months ago. Uh, it's a digital bass amp mm-hmm. or monoblock. Um, but I used to play through a MOSFET bass amp. What do you think the difference is between the two? Uh-huh. Well, let me just explain to everybody uh, that uh, relatively recently there has been a, an uptick in the uh, use of what's called a digital amplifier, which basically right. takes takes in a signal. Isn't that just basically just for the money? I mean... Well, there's a couple of reasons why. Uh, I won't explain how it works. It doesn't matter. Um, it uh, It is far more efficient than an analog amplifier. Uh, okay. So it converts much more of the input signal to an output signal without generating a lot of heat. Right, right. Um, well, this is, this is fan-cooled. This well, is you know, it's, you know, it generates, still generates some heat, so, sure, so sure. okay. Um... It, they're they're often less expensive. I will say that digital amps are more commonly used for the low frequencies, so I'm not at all surprised that your bass amp is digital. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. The the other kind, the the analog amp, you you mentioned MOSFET, which is M O S F E T, metal right. oxide semiconductor field effect transistor. Right. Okay, so that is an analog type of amplifier. Uh, which uses a solid-state device. It's not a tube-based amp. Um, well, the one that I have, believe it or not, though, does have a tube preamp in it. Oh, okay. So it has a tube preamp, but a MOSFET yeah. uh, output but stage. A MOSFET out, but a MOSFET power section. Power yeah. section. Okay. Um, so what are the differences between them, other than efficiency? Because the, the, your, your tube-based MOSFET amplifier is very inefficient. It generates a lot okay. of heat, I'll bet. Right. Uh, um, but they have digital and analog amps have different tonal characters. Uh, MOS, uh, MOSFET, uh, analog amps in general, and tube preamps in particular, have a very warm quality right. to them. Right, right. Whereas digital amps are very flat. Some people call them analytical, some people call them dry. Um,. So, you know, it, that's well, a matter of personal preference. Well, I'm blind, and I, and I 
immediately the first night that I started playing through this amp, I, I immediately heard the difference, and I was like, "Gee, I don't know whether I want to." <laughs> uh, and of course, the more I played it, and the more I played around with it, the the, the more custom I got to it. And I, and mm -hmm. I guess it's all right. I mean, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't jump up and down about it. But um, well, and did you jump up and down about your about your uh, analog amp? I had had many many compliments on how sweet that thing sounded yeah. uh, when I played it. Many compliments. Well, but, um, you know, there the there you go. Comment, the other comment that I would like to make, well, the only problem is I, I think I see more of the companies moving one toward minute. digital uh, because when I had researched buying a new one, that's basically uh, in the price range of, of say, six $700. That's basically what you would get would be a digital amp. Yeah. Um, well, but, that is true. They're, 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 more, they're less expensive. Um, and, and home theater uh, and re audio reproduction is also moving towards digital. Full range. Yeah, I have, a, uh, I have a Sony, and I wish I could tell you the model of it, but you were talking about sound bars. What this thing is, is it's a little sound bar. Mm. I've got a Bravia 40-inch uh, uh, Sony, mm -hmm. and this little thin speaker sits, believe it or not, it's thin enough that I can sit it right on top of that uh, TV. I made two little brackets that'll make sure it won't flip off the back. Sure. And uh, put it on there, and I've this this Sony soundbar has also a subwoofer, like you were saying, that connects to it. Yep. And it does a really neat job, considering for what it is. Now, I do have a 6.1 uh, JVC surround system, mm -hmm. which I use when I really want to raise a little heck in the house or something <laughs> like that. Well, you want that real immersion. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for calling. I'm sorry we're out of time here. But uh, this is Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek, sitting in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, all you hip cats and hip kittens, it's Scott Wilkinson coming at you over the airwaves. <laughs> this, is, um, this is the Cabrillo College Reunion Jazz Band, a band that I played in 35 years ago. And uh, we got together for a reunion concert. This is a live recording uh, made last fall. Uh, and it was amazing. It was amazing to sit in this band with same, many of the same people I sat in uh, with the band with uh, 35 years ago. In fact, I was reading the music and some of my notes that I put in that music 35 years ago were still there. <laughs> I was amazed. I was like, wait, that's my handwriting. <laughs> there's, the, there's the trombone section. And... Uh, What's this section? This this particular tune is called Bebop Charlie. Rich Fenno. Oh, and there's Rich Fenno doing a solo. <laughs> I don't think anybody in Santa Cruz can hear this because. Oh, that's not Rich Fenno. That's uh, that's my friend Steve Wilson. Hey, very good. I hope he's listening. He's down in Santa Cruz. He still lives in Santa Cruz. Thirty-five years later. Yeah, yeah. Grooving. So cool. Thank you, Kyle, so much for playing this. This is uh, this is taking me back. Taking me back big time. But you know what? We're here to talk about home theater, so I can't stay in uh, memory lane too very long, much as I would love to. Um... Instead, I'm going to go to uh, Vaughn in Laguna, California. Hey, Vaughn, you're on with Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek. Hey, Scott, how are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. Just rocking out there for a minute, sorry. <laughs> yeah. um, I have one question for you and two recommendations after that if I have time. Sure, go the for first it. Question, the first question is, I walked into a Sony store, and they were displaying a Blu-ray and sound system combo purchasing when and they were displaying the movie thor and then mm. there's there's this particular scene that i watched there where it was all quiet and the king just pounds his staff on the floor oh, and, yeah. and you could and you can literally feel like you're in yeah. a hallway like in in like a castle or something even though it's just a flat image on the screen it sounds really real i remember and, that scene very well yeah and i'm just i'm just wondering is there a, I know they don't go too cheap, but is there a reasonable price for Blu-ray and sound system combo purchasing? Sure. Uh, what you're talking about is really called a home theater in a box. 
Okay. Okay, which is a, a system that includes a receiver, uh, a Blu-ray player, often combined in the same physical cabinet, and then a 5.1 or a 7.1 speaker system, and all the cables you need that are often color-coded, so it's very difficult to make a mistake. You can just hook it up. It's very easy. Yeah. And uh, I do recommend, if you're going to get a home theater in a box system, or HTIB, as we often call it, uh, that you do get one with a Blu-ray player, not a DVD player. You're still, you can still find them with, with DVD players, but that's only standard definition. And you really, really want... Blu-ray with high definition, if you if you possibly can. Yeah, that's what I was going for because yeah. Blu-ray is the best way to watch movies. Yeah, yeah, um, no question. Uh, where's the Where's a good place to buy those? Um, well, uh, just about any place, I think. Uh, uh, Best Buy, Fry's, um, Costco carries them. I'm sure. A um, lot, lot of places do. You want to do a little research, though. You probably won't be able to audition them. You know, yes. you won't be able to go in and actually, unlike what you did, you, you actually they had one set up and you could go in and you could hear it. Was it in any kind of realistic or reasonable environment, like in a room or was it out on this giant show floor? Yes, it was like in a, it was as they were imitating it as if it was like a living room. Perfect. That's exactly what you want to find if you can in a, in a dealer is a, is a dealer that has a room like that, that you can actually audition in a reasonable circumstance. Yeah, and uh, you know Sony makes good ones. Samsung makes good ones. Panasonic makes good ones. Onkyo, the last Onkyo we did was their top of the line, uh, 9400 THX. We were very happy with the receiver. It did not come with a Blu-ray player. You had to buy a separate Blu-ray player. Uh, okay. But we weren't really that happy with the speakers. Now I will tell you this about home theater in a box. Um, the okay. Very often, they do, they do not have a lot of inputs for other devices like game consoles or cable or satellite boxes or things like that. So if you have a, a variety of source devices that you want to plug in, many home theater in a box systems won't let you do that more than one or two. So you want to keep that in mind when you're shopping. The Onkyo let you have a bunch of inputs, but it didn't have a Blu-ray player. You had to buy that separately. Okay, um, that's pretty good. And um, one of my recommendations for you is the next time, uh, I think, in, personally, in my opinion, the next time you review a Blu-ray player or a sound system with watching a movie, mm -hmm. I really recommend you uh, view it with Steven Spielberg's The Adventures of Tintin because I think those animated movies really pop up with those colors really well. Oh, they do. And they I do. Think, yeah, yeah. And especially because they come in like a 3D combo pack, I think it's really good on Blu-ray 3D as well. Well, here's, here's one problem. I agree with you. Uh, uh, animated, animated movies look great. And that's actually one problem with using them in reviews because they make everything, every display, look really good. Yeah. So what we try to do in our reviews more often than not is play the stuff that is what we call a torture test. You know, we want to see it how well a display or a sound system performs with difficult material. Animated yeah. stuff is usually really easy material to make look good and sound good. But, um, and sound good, I mean, sir, I, I'll, I'll use uh, animated content to test sound systems, no problem. But I tend not to with video products because it doesn't reveal anything, any problems. Uh, I see. And my uh, last recommendation for you is I know you're a movie fan. This Friday, um, Marvel's The Avengers opens up, and oh. I think... And I think that's going to be a really, really good experience. I think I, I recommend you to go watch that. You bet. You bet. I'm planning to. I think it's going to be great. I loved Thor. Um, I did not see Captain America. I loved Iron Man. Um, so I'm looking forward very much to seeing the Avengers. I think it's going to be great. Uh, go see it in 3D. Go see it in IMAX if you can, because yeah, IMAX is the best 3D. Yeah, I bought tickets for IMAX. Good. Excellent. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks so much for calling. Okay. Okay, I got a minute left. I am going to go to Tony in East Tennessee. Hey, Tony, you're on with Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek. Welcome. Hey, Scott, I appreciate you talking to me. No problem. Enjoy listening to you and Leo all the time. Thank you so much. I've got a question for you. On uh, I'm in the process of building the home theater. I've had my sound surround sound for a long time with an Anthem D2, mm -hmm. and I want to. I'm the Q750i Runco LED. Mm-hmm. Okay, you're hearing a lot about 4K now. Yeah. That's 
far enough down the road not to worry about right now. Would you say? What's I would say. No, I would I would generally generally speaking say yes. Uh, how big is your screen? Oh, you know what? Well, can you can you hang on? Can can you hang on a second? We've got uh yes. we got we come to the end of the hour just hold on there. This is Scott Wilkinson, the Home Theater Geek in for Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. Hey, it's Scott Wilkinson here. Back at you, the Home Theater Geek sitting in for Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. I don't know who this is. Kyle, who what music is this? It's really great. I thought Chris would recognize it. Oh, maybe Chris will, will recognize it. <laughs> My, uh, it's from the '80s, but don't, don't, don't uh, ask me. I don't really. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's from, from sometime in the '80s. <laughs> okay, well, very good. Well, this this might give you a clue out there in Radio Land that it's time to talk to Chris Marquart, our uh, photo guy who uh, I'm really happy to finally, in, in all of my subbing for Leo, uh, <laughs> we, I haven't uh, managed to get Chris on, mostly in my own fault for forgetting that it's his segment, and I really <laughs> wanted to get him on here uh, because I happen to be an avid photographer myself, but in talking with Chris offline, um, I found that, uh, that he's also a musician and uh, it has a yeah, recording so studio and stuff, so we here. share a lot of things. Exactly. Hey, Chris, thank you so much for coming on. <laughs> Scott, it's good to be finally geeking out with you yes, about things. We I, get mean, to... I was really looking forward to that, so <laughs> very happy to be here. We um, get to geek out together, finally. I'm really happy about that, yeah. Not as active a musician anymore as I, as I wish I would be, but um, still got a bass guitar hanging back there on the wall somehow. Yeah, do you still play um, every once in a while? Get it down and warm up Once in a while, yeah, but not enough. <laughs> not not nearly enough. So yeah. I have to pick that up again. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the reason, uh, the, the thing I wanted to talk to you about is I, I, I was trying to think, okay, what can we, how can we bring that photography and home theater thing together? And um, now if, <laughs> I think we ended up with projectors. Because yes. A, a camera is pretty much... The same thing as a projector, just just pretty much the other way around. So <laughs> in with reverse, the camera, you have something big that you that you project into the camera through a lens onto yeah. a small surface, the yeah. sensor, and yeah. that digitizes the picture. Yeah, and a projector reverses that, and you have a small thing that projects out through a lens and makes a big picture. So it's that's exactly that's, the the other way around. Yeah, that, that and you know what? That's also very much like um, microphones and speakers. Yes, they are pretty much the same thing. The, the same idea, where you have a sound wave coming yeah. into a microphone, it gets converted into an electrical signal by bouncing on a diaphragm, and then the speaker does the opposite thing. It has a diaphragm that wiggles and creates sound that goes out into the, uh, into the atmosphere. When I was a kid, that I, I, I one time killed a microphone this way by hooking it up to, <laughs> to an output. <laughs> and I actually could hear sound from the microphone, a very faint sound, and then yes. it just went up in smoke. And then it went smoke. up in smoke, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it did work. So Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so a few things about projectors. Um, I use them in my workshops. I use them all the time in mm -hmm. photography. Um, when you want to show pictures, projectors are actually a nice idea. I mean, we used to project slides on the wall and mm -hmm. um, a, a lit a picture, a big picture on the wall is of something beautiful. But just a, just a few things, okay, how, how does a projector work? And uh, for anyone who wants to go buy a projector, I, I won't be able to give you names, models, prices and these kind of things, but just some general ideas about them. For example, LCD versus DLP. Mm -hmm. Those are the big system. There's LCOS in between, but LCD is like a slide, right? You project through an LCD. Um, right. A DLP is more like a mirror, so it bounces off a mirror through a, through, um, a color wheel. We'll yep. get into that in a second. Sure. Um, but those are, those are pretty much the two important systems that are out there at this point. Right. LCOS is um, kind of a combination of the two. It's, a, it's an yep. LCD panel, but it has a mirror behind it. So the light passes through the LCD panel, but then bounces right. off the mirror and back out to the lens. So it's kind of right. a combination of those two. I haven't seen an LCOS projector yet. Are they any good? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. JVC uh, LCOS projectors are fabulous. Okay. They're really, really oh, good. good. Highly recommended. So, uh, a few years ago, I talked to a guy who worked for HP, and back back when they were still making projectors, um, he he told me that they had a color for the white screen that you project on. Mm -hmm. They would call that what do you call that color? White, obviously. Yes. But as soon as you start projecting on that, they would have a different name for that color. They would call it black. 
<laughs> because that is pretty much as dark as that screen gets, right? The projector won't be able to make it any darker. So right. in projection, that white screen is your black point. That's the darkest thing you have. And uh, something that I think everybody who doesn't really completely darken down their, their projection room uh, fights is daylight or any sort of light. Yes. Because that takes away from the contrast. Because what it does, it, it makes that black... I'm making air quotes here, black screen, that white screen, uh, a bit brighter. And by raising that black point, you lose contrast so quickly. That, so quickly. And, th and that's the reason why cinemas darken down. And this is exactly why I hate those right. emergency exit lights in cinemas. Because they <laughs> kind of take away that black point. That's true. They have to, they have to be on, of course, for safety reasons. But uh, they, they yeah. are kind of uh, distracting, certainly. And you're exactly right that... Um, you really, if you're going to have a projection system, you really want to have complete control of the uh, ambient light in the room. Because as you say, if you don't, the black point, the black level that you experience, that you see on the screen will rise, the contrast will decrease, the picture won't pop, it'll look washed out. And it's it's really interesting because in photography also contrast is really key to to how well an image pops. It's yes. not necessarily the absolute values of black and white. It's more the contrast between them that makes that picture come to life. Right. Very often, especially if you look at black and white photography, really dark blacks make a really popping picture. And interestingly enough, if you look at a projector, the way and I'm gonna talk about DLP here, the way they make the 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 white seem more black uh, the way they kind of bring that picture to life is mm -hmm. by throwing a whole lot of light on that screen they pretty much create a lot of contrast um between the the darkest possible level on the screen mm -hmm. and it's interesting because the way dlp works um is that the mirror the mirror the light bounces of a mirror goes through a color wheel. That color wheel spins and has all the different colors on it. Sort of like, a, then, sort of like pie wedges. You have these filters of red, green, exactly. and blue in these pie wedges around the screen, and around the circle, rather, the, the wheel. And then this wheel spins, and as the green segment rotates into the light path, you see the green part of the image. And then as the red filter rotates into the light path, you see the red image on the screen, and so on and so on and so on very quickly. And now you know how they make it even brighter. You know how they they kind of raise that contrast level to really, really big levels. How's that? They have they have a so-called white segment in there. It's a segment that is oh, no yeah. color, that yep. is white. So what happens is they add more of that white to the entire picture to kind of increase that brightness. But if you want to show photography or really beautiful colors, that white segment is going to be in your way that's going to take away away of the mm. overall quality which is why when you set a projector to cinema mode typically the image goes a bit darker but you get better colors because that switches off the wide segment ah i didn't don't think i knew that okay i certainly always recommend setting the projector or any display really to cinema mode because that's going to be exactly. a more accurate uh, color reproduction, but I didn't realize that that switched off the uh, the clear segment. If the w color wheel has it, not all projectors have that clear segment in their color mm -hmm. wheel. But in, in order to get to those huge specs that you sometimes see on the websites or in the manuals, mm -hmm. um, those those enormous contrast numbers, sometimes, I don't know, what have I seen lately? 50,000 to 1 oh, or something? Oh, yeah, or millions to 1. Uh, th those are all bogus yes. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> totally bogus. You know, in the few seconds we have left, I did want to ask you one quick question about the color accuracy of DLP projectors or LCD projectors yes. when per, when showing photographs, because the photographs are taken in a different color space than what movies are made in. Yes. Um, well, you can profile a projector the same way you can profile a computer screen by getting an according color meter, um, setting it up according to the instructions of the of the uh, color meter pr uh, producer, mm -hmm. and you will be able to put that in the light path, and it will it'll um, shine different colors at the color meter, and it will basically give you a better picture than you had before. Fantastic, Chris Marquardt. Thanks so much for being on. This is Scott Wilkinson, the Home Theater Geek. In for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. This is for you, Linus. It's Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek, sitting in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy.
And of course, Kyle Benham coming up with, uh, actually Linus in the chat room made this suggestion. Kyle probably would have come up with it himself anyway. Cindy Lauper singing True Colors. And uh, that's what we we were talking about, Chris Marquardt and I, in the last segment, about how do you get true colors uh, of photographs, digital photographs, on a projector. And uh, unfortunately, we ran out of time before we were able to explore that fully. But uh, I think it's an excellent topic that uh, next time I get the opportunity to, I will pursue with our photo guy, Chris Marquardt, who also happens to be a projector guy and a music guy. Very versatile fellow. Meanwhile, we were talking to Tony about projectors. I'm going to get him back on. Hey, Tony, thanks for waiting. Yes. So um, you're talking about, you're building a home theater. You were talking about a Runco Q750i projector, which uses LED illumination instead of a bulb, which uh, in many respects I like a lot. Um, for one okay, thing, I've got a controlled room for it, too. And so. you do have a light-controlled room. Excellent. I was yeah. asking you how big yeah. your screen is. Okay, we're going to go with between 105 and 115. I know they recommend about, what, 98, I think, 93 to 98. Yeah, so you're going a little bigger, but that's okay if you've got light control. If you're totally light controlled, you can turn... And have you got the walls and ceiling and floor of uh, some dark neutral color? Well, I will. I'm in the process of doing all that. Mm -hmm. I would definitely recommend yeah. that. Don't use white walls. A lot of people, right, right. you know, there's a special color that I've painted my testing studio and my home, my own home theater, which is called Munsell Gray, M-U-N-S-E-L-L. -L. It's a special color of gray that has no hue. That is, it has no blue bias or red bias or green bias. It's right there in the black and white area of things. And just get it okay. down as dark as you can. Um, when I was doing my home... Do same color too sorry would you do the ceiling the same way too? absolutely yes indeed ceiling same now it okay. makes it makes the building look a little i mean the room look a little uh i mean it's a little dark it's uh, perhaps a little claustrophobic i i didn't go pure black you could yeah. you, you could go pure black but i felt that that would be a little too oppressive yeah so i went with nine percent reflectivity Okay, which is a very dark gray. And, okay. it, you know, when you turn the lights off in there, it's a black hole. Well, that's what you want when you watch the movie. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. And especially with the Runco Q750, which uses LEDs as its illumination source. And I should explain that most projectors use a lamp. It's kind of like a fancy light bulb, um, yeah. which produces a white light. And then either you have, as Chris and I were talking about in the last segment, a color wheel that spins and gives you a red filter, a green filter, and a blue filter in quick succession. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the um, a lamp, you have to replace every 1,000 hours or so. They claim right. two or 3,000 hours, but uh, and that's several hundred dollars. Now with yeah, and that's the reason I was looking at the LED, because... You know, you can turn it on and off, and you're not hurting the, uh, the light on it. That's yet. exactly right. And those LEDs are going to last tens of thousands of hours. And right. be, and they're also going to be very, very stable. Lamps, regular regular white lamps, you turn them on, and after 100 hours, they drop in brightness, and they change in color a little bit. And uh, then over time, they slowly drop as well. Uh, LEDs stay very, very stable. Now the one disadvantage, okay. the one disadvantage of them is that they aren't very bright. They don't put out as much light as a, a traditional lamp, which is why. So if, you have, uh, if you have a controlled room and you calibrate the unit. Yep, that's the answer. That is good. that's exactly the answer, and you don't get too big a screen, which is why I think Runco probably recommends a ninety-six inch screen. You're going a little bigger than that, okay? So you might not get as much light off of the screen as you would with a 96. But then again, you're going to get a better black level. And with total light control of the room in a dark room, I think it's going to look fantastic. I've seen some LED illuminated projectors in a, in a dark room, and I really love the look of them. So I think you're going to be well, real happy with that. What's the biggest screen you think I can go with and, and be safe? 
Uh, I'd have to do a little uh, a little research on that. I suppose I would guess up to 120. 120. Yeah, that might be put. That might be pushing it. So yeah, I'd I'd say maybe 105. I've got a 102 okay. inch two by uh, 2.35 to one screen, so that's wider than your normal 16 by nine screen. And well, I'm going with the the 235 also. Ah, you are. What screen material? Yes. Well, I'm probably going to go with the Stuart for the Studio Tech, and I I think it's 100, but I'm not sure. I don't have the paper in front of me. Well, uh, are you going to do? Th uh, does this projector do 3D? I don't remember. I don't think it does. No, no. I'm not into 3D. I, I'm, I don't. I don't like 3D that much. Okay. Well, good then. I, to tell you the truth, I love a 100. The, by the way, the 100 uh, is a special screen material that reflects light in all directions equally. It has a gain, a gain of 1.0, and it's only appropriate. The only place you can use it is a theater with very dark walls and total light control, such as we're talking about. That's exactly the screen I have in my projector testing room, is a Stuart Studio okay. Tech 100. 102 inches wide, 235 to 1 aspect ratio in a room painted Munsell gray uh, with 9% reflectivity. That's a lot of gobbledygook to, for everybody to uh, digest there. But uh, yeah. what you're talking about, I would really be happy sitting in that room watching a movie. Okay. Now get back to the 4K for one second. Oh, sure. I've got a buddy of mine. We've been arguing about this back and forth. And, you know, you hear a lot about it. You know, a lot of your receivers are, are starting to put, some of your receivers are starting to put upscale on to 4K. Yep. But like you said earlier, that's something you could even, you should not consider right now, right? No, uh, I wouldn't. There, There is no way, there's no plan in place for uh, studios to distribute 4K material to the right. home. So, and that's not going to be for a while. That's really not going to be okay. for a while. I want to. I do want to say oh, that SoCal Ray Jr. in the chat room is uh, is being quite vociferous in his recommendation of a Studio Tech 130, which has a gain of one. Uh, yeah, it has a gain of 1.3, so you'll get a little more light back to your seating position, but the uh -huh. off-axis light won't be as good. So if you have a wide angle, if you have people sitting way over to the side, there they will see. I will a, not. Well, then I might suggest a 130. Um, okay. be because the LEDs do have less light coming out of them, uh, the 130 will will bring more light back to a central seating position. And uh, okay. with the LEDs, that might really be a better choice. Um, I do okay. I do tend to... Uh, Ray, so SoCal Ray Jr. is a very knowledgeable fellow about this sort of thing. And uh, I, I can understand his point. I use a 100 mostly as a review tool because it gives me exactly what the projector's putting out. But in the case okay. of, a, of a home use, I might suggest going with a 130. Okay. And that Q750, I can't go wrong with it, can I? I don't think so. I, I think uh, I think we reviewed it. Go to hometheater.com. I look have operated it, and, and uh, uh, you know, what, what the review you gave on it was great. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a fabulous projector. It's expensive. It's a run yeah. so it's expensive. Well, but if you have the money, you know, go for it. Well, they got a good deal on right now. And that's the reason I'm not really looking. I'm not ready to do one till about next year. But the price is right right now, and I can't, you know, can't hardly turn it down. Hey, there you go. Good luck to you. All right, let me ask you one more thing for you. On the like the Integra eighty point three mm -hmm. has four K upscaling in it. Yep. That is is that going to do you any good? I don't think so. It's certainly not without a 4K projector. And even then, the tests we've done with 4K upscaling, which is taking uh -huh. uh, high definition 1080p, 1920 by 1080 pixels, upscaling uh -huh. that to 4K, which is uh, 4096. Actually, I think the, the Integra goes to 3840 by 2160. Okay. Uh, and looking at that on a 4K projector, you don't really gain that much. 30 seconds. So okay. I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's uh, it's a big deal right now, and the only 4K projectors you can get are from Sony, which is twenty five grand, and from yeah. JVC, which won't accept a 4K signal. It'll only upscale to actually Quad HD, which is this thirty eight forty by twenty one sixty. And that's an E shift. I'm sorry, with the E shift, correct? That's the feature yeah. that they use to, to to do that upscaling. 
Um, I don't think it's that big a deal. I wouldn't worry about it in your case, certainly not with the Runco 750. Thanks so much for the call. This is Scott Wilkinson. I appreciate that very much. Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek, sitting in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, hello there. Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek and online editor of hometheater.com, filling in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. He's uh, he's out of the country right now. He might be flying back. He might be in the air as we speak, as a matter of fact. He was in Norway for a week attending the Northern Lights Photographic Festival. Probably took a bunch of pictures. And I'm sure looking forward to hearing all about his adventures when he returns to these airwaves next week. Meanwhile, we are here talking about home theater. Big screen TVs, projectors, surround sound speakers, AVRs, AV receivers, Blu-ray players. All the stuff that brings stories to your home in an electronic manner. But not only that. I'm also very interested in uh, commercial cinema. I like going out to the movies. Some people don't, but I do. I like the social experience, and I like the bigger screen and uh, the ability to see things that uh, aren't available at home yet. Partly it's my job, and I must admit I really love my job, where I get to uh, report on these things. I write about them on hometheater.com where, in fact, um, I answer questions two or three times a week. And if you care to uh, send me an email where, uh, with a question, uh, you can do so at scott at techguylabs.com. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say I get far more questions than I can answer, but I try and pick representative ones, and I answer as many as I can, and you can go to hometheater.com, and uh, my blog there for that is Ask Home Theater. And, uh, uh, you know, c- clearly I, I take as many calls as I can on the show, but I can only get a few of those. So I try to answer as many as I can uh, on my website. So if you do have any questions, uh, hopefully I will be able to answer it on hometheater.com if you send send it to scott at techguylabs.com and of course techguylabs.com is the website for this show the tech guy and uh, you can go there to get the show notes everything we've talked about today and yesterday is being faithfully written down by James Deruvo and will be posted on the website in short order you can also get this show as a podcast later on it will be posted on iTunes and YouTube and uh, twit.tv. And in this particular case, since I'm the host, it will also be posted on my website, hometheater.com. Now, if you have a question today, we have one more hour to go, and uh, I'll be taking as many calls as I can. And you can get in by calling 8888-ASK-LEO, which translates to 888 888- Eight two seven five five three six, or you can join the chat room, and I sure hope you do because uh, that's a really fun place to hang out. I always watch it whenever I'm on any of the shows I do here, uh, this one, or my own podcast called Home Theater Geeks, which records Mondays from one thirty to two thirty p.m. Pacific time, or four thirty to five thirty p.m. Eastern time. You can tune in live at live.twit.tv, and you can join the chat room, and I pass on questions from the chat room to my various guests on that show as well. There's about 775 people in the chat room right now, and um, they're what Leo calls the smart kids in the back of the room. And whenever there's a question that I can't answer, or maybe some additional information that I maybe didn't think about... No doubt about it, somebody in the chat room will bring it up and bring it to my attention. And I so appreciate Leo's brain, which this weekend is Scott's brain. So uh, I'm going to get right back to the phones here, and I'm going to talk to Aaron, uh, Justin sorry, in Austin, Texas. Hey, Justin, welcome to the show. Uh, it's Jason. Uh, Jason, I'm sorry. Pardon me. 
Okay, okay. Thanks for hosting the show this weekend, uh, Scott. I'm never able to uh, listen to your show on Mondays, and I'm very much a uh, TV and video, audio geek like yourself. You're and, a geek. And just love, <laughs> I just love talking about it and stuff. And yeah, and me I, too. I have a nice, uh, I have a nice little st- uh, home theater. Yeah. Um, Excellent. A little background: I have a um, a 60 inch uh, Pioneer plasma. Okay, how old is it? And it is almost four years old, and I estimate that I have 12,000 hours of use on it. Mm-hmm. I don't use it for video games at all. Good. And I mainly watch sports and, you know, sitcoms uh, mm-hmm. of that nature and mm-hmm. a lot of concerts. Good. And I also have a Pioneer Elite receiver and Paradigm uh, surround sound speakers, which oh, I love. Sounds like a great, sounds like <laughs> a great system to me. Yeah. My only concern is uh, some of I've, I've been watching movies. Uh, I just the other weekend I was watching uh, Moneyball. Great movie, by the way. Really great uh, movie. It is, and um, this TV show Game of uh, Game of Thrones. Oh on yeah, HBO. very popular. It's a little too bloody for me, but people just just rave about it. So okay. Yeah. Um, so really, two two questions. The main question is when I. Watch that show and that other and, the, and movies that have a lot of uh, a lot of black on the screen. Mm-hmm. Uh, the past month or so, I've noticed in the center of the TV, in the upper center of the TV, um, I'll see a little bit of purple where I think should be black. Hmm. I'm not. I don't know if this if, if it's the camera maybe moving too fast. I'm wondering if the TV is running out of plasma. Um, <laughs> Well, that's a that's a fallacy that that is perpetrated too often. That uh, plasma TVs uh, that the gas leaks out and has to be recharged or replaced. That is not true. The plasma stays in there just fine. Um, okay. But uh, you, you say you you think you have about twelve thousand hours on this uh, on this set. Yeah, that's what I, I estimate. If, if if I go eight hours a day, which I don't, right, uh, seven days a week. Yeah. For fifty-two weeks, for almost which under that's that's an exaggeration. Probably it's not even twelve. It's probably closer to eleven. Okay, thousand. Well, and, you know, um, you, it shouldn't be a problem because uh, most plasma TVs, even back that old, were rated at uh, you know forty, fifty, sixty thousand hours. Yes. So you shouldn't be having a problem uh, because of its age. Okay. Okay. Now, um, it, yeah, I just. You say that there's a black area, that when, whenever there is a black area, it kind of looks a little purplish, perhaps? Um, yeah, just in little small little parts where, I guess, actually, I see it more so where um, it'll be, majority of the screen will be black, but any spot where there'll be white or lighter images, there'll be, you'll see just, I don't want to say a shadow of, of, uh, of purple, like a purple, like magenta. Maybe even a uh, kind minute. of color that, it, but it's just there, just for a split second. Huh. I just don't know if the TV can keep up with the speed, but that shouldn't be an issue with plasma. No, it, it really shouldn't be an issue. Um, no. I can't think off the top of my head what that might be. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Mubi in the chat room is saying early plasmas were rather flaky, weren't they? And yes, they were. But this is not an early plasma. Is it one of the? It's one of the early curos, I, I would guess. It's not a Kuro. Uh, the Pioneer at the time had just their regular 50 and 60 inch, uh-huh. and then they also had 50, 60 inch Kuro. And right. I know they stopped production for a while, and they just restarted it again. And um, I, I love the TV, and I'm, I'm, that's something I didn't want to cheap out on when I bought it. No, and I, I agree with you. That was a, that was a smart move. Um, I'll, I'll 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 monitor the chat room and see what they have to say. Um, so, Cal Ray, if, if you're still in the chat room, you might have something to say about this. A little bit of um, uh, Web80 Web says it's a known issue with Kuros. Google it. But this isn't a Kuro, so that may not be the issue there. Thanks so much for the call, Jason. It's Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek, in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. The canyons were burning. This is Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek, sitting in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. What we're listening to here is my wife, Joanna Kasdan, from her album Living Through History. This is a tune uh, that uh, she wrote, and uh, we recorded, I think it was about 
1997, 98, something like that. It was a while ago. And that saxophone you hear is actually a synthesized saxophone. The instrument is the Yamaha VL1, a great uh, wind instrument synthesizer that uses a technology called physical modeling, which is fascinating. It takes the mathematics of acoustic wind instruments, like a soprano saxophone or a trumpet or something, and generates waveforms based upon that ma- those mathematics. And I'm using a, an essentially an electronic saxophone, the Yamaha WX5, to control the synthesizer. It responds to breath pressure, changing breath pressure, and um, really creates a very convincing uh, soprano saxophone. And uh, so thanks, Kyle, for playing a little bit of uh, Joanna's album. Uh, She has a lovely voice and one of the many reasons I fell in love with her. So uh, let's get right back to the phones. I'm going to go to Dave in Fullerton. How you doing? Hey, hey, Scott. If your wife is as pretty as she sounds, uh, she's your lucky man. Oh, (laughs) thank you so much. I certainly think so. (laughs) That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank Uh, you very much. I'm so glad to get in touch with you today. I'm so glad you're taking the show this weekend. It's perfect timing for me. Thanks. I got a question. I recently upgraded from an old Sony 5.1 receiver Mm -hmm. to a new Onkyo uh, TXNR609. Very nice. Got a a good price on it. Excellent. So, at any rate, I've been always running the Sony through uh, a Bose Acoustamass system. Okay. 5.1 system. And a strange thing happened during the purchase of that system many, many moons ago, about 99, is I ended up with two extra satellite speakers for it. And I was wondering, it just occurred to me, <clears throat> since a 7.2 Onkyo receiver, I was wondering if I could take those extra speakers I had, they're in boxes in the garage, mm-hmm. and just run them directly to the receiver uh, to add the uh, add the uh, surround sound either for the rear or the sides. You're talking about th- these are two extra Bose satellites. Correct. The answer is no. No. I'm really I, sorry I, to okay. say that. <laughs> yeah, I understand that that the base module, the acoustic yeah. does the filtering. I'm and, afraid so. There, I'm afraid so. They're there designed that way. There is crossover adjustments on the Onkyo. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, you could you could try it. I I asked Bose this question, and they basically said, "Don't do it. It's not the way it's designed to be used. It won't sound very good." I so see. I'm really well, sorry to say that that's not going to be a good solution for you. Um, and uh, you know, if you ask me, I would say your next upgrade would be to uh, another speaker system. That's what it sounded like. Well. Disappointing answer, but a very appreciative man here for uh, taking my call. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your call, and uh, uh, good luck. Uh, The Pioneer uh, speakers that I was talking about earlier today uh, are are fabulous and not very expensive. So uh, when you can when you can afford to shell out five six hundred bucks, if you have the room for them, they're a little bulky. Certainly more bulky than the Bose, but you will get a far better audio experience. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Let's go to Mike in Arcadia. Arcadia. Hey, Mike. Welcome hey, Mike, to the show. Welcome to the show. That's just a many, many moons ago, about 99. Holy, uh, smokes, holy smokes, Mike. Smokes, take, Mike. Take, take, turn down your radio. Down your radio. Hello? Yeah, hey, Mike. Will you turn down your radio, please? Yeah, it's down. Okay, great. How can I help you? Is this Scott? That's me. How are you doing? Um, I just wanted to ask you a question. Uh, you and uh, Leo seem to... Uh, tell the majority of the people who call who have problems with their older units mm-hmm. to usually buy a new one. Um, I've been a, an electronic technician since 1978, and uh, I'd like to hear uh, hear you give the mom and pop places a chance to salvage these things. Well, um, you know that's that's a good point, and I'm I'm glad you're making it. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, as you probably know, the mom and pop stores are kind of disappearing. They are, and, uh, and I blame well, I blame Best Buy for that. They <laughs> put Circuit City out of business. They, uh, you know, they they've really 
done a number on themselves. They've had to lay off quite a number of people. Yeah, lately. they've shopped a bunch. They've, they've closed a bunch of stores, laid off a bunch of people. They've sort of, sort of. It's a self fulfilling prophecy in a sense. Yeah, in the, in my experience, and I, I, I'm not in consumer electronics anymore. Uh, Working industrial electronics. But, you know, the majority of the people want something that works, and they don't need to have the brand new, you know, they're not all audiophiles or videophiles, and uh, I think you may, the callers may want to give the the local places a $30 kill charge to check and see if their stuff can be repaired. Well, if some, you know, if, if a local place, if a local place will get, will do a $30 diagnostic, I mean, most of the places I've gone, the diagnostics is like 90 bucks or so. And well, then, again, I've been out of consumer for a while, too, so you're probably right. <laughs> and um, then the repair, if that if they are going to do a repair, it's several hundred dollars at least. So it depends on the product, too. But very often it's going to be not worth the money to re- repair something when you can buy something new with, with better features and better performance for re- something around the same amount of money. And that's the point. What happened, really, I think, in when the flat panels came out, and you started getting parts from China and uh, other places. They didn't play by the rules, and there was no documentation for repairing these things. I'll tell you, I got a, a manual once from uh, LG, and I was trying to figure out how to adjust the gamma. I forget. But in there was thrown in, it said, if this does not work, contact your local district attorney. That was in the manual. <laughs> that was in the manual? So I think they're they're trying to just say here here's a manual. It doesn't really make sense or and the, wow. the circuit diagrams are incorrect. So anyway, that you know, that's why a lot of the mom and pops are going out of business. You yeah. get parts, they don't work. Um but anyway, it's I, a difficult it's, problem. It's, it's a, a, di- a pet peeve of mine for years. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a throwaway thing. Hey, listen, I I'm with you. I, I, somebody in the chat room talked talked about how you know buying new things all the time causes you know brings more waste into the world, and that's a drag. Certainly, I recommend e-cycling for your old electronics instead of just tossing it out. But you know, the mom and pop stores are going away. Repair prices are very high. It's a very difficult question. But I bring I thank you so much for bringing it up because it's worth thinking about well i appreciate you talking to me thank you so much bye-bye i enjoyed the show thank you thank you i really appreciate it okay before we um move along i think uh, we don't have quite enough time to take another call this round but we're going to get to that very shortly i will let you know that in case you just tuned in uh, my name is scott wilkinson i am the home theater geek and i'm filling in for leo laporte the tech guy back right after this This portion of the Tech Guy Show is brought to you by DSL Extreme, Leo's own uh, internet service provider. For super fast internet access at an amazing price, it's DSL Extreme. The music you're hearing is from the Southern California Early Music Consort, the band that I have played in for many years at the Renaissance Fair. This is the Loud Ensemble. I'm playing bass sack butt, as a matter of fact, in this recording. It's uh, one of the processionals that we played for the Queen herself, Elizabeth I, as she processed through the Shire. It's a far distance to go from the Renaissance Fair and wearing tights and uh, drinking mead to talking about home theater on the radio and the internet, but that's exactly the path I have taken in my life. And I'm so happy to be with you here today talking about one of my favorite subjects, home theater, audio, and video. I'm Scott Wilkinson, of course, uh, the home theater geek, filling in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy, and uh, got a couple, a bunch of interesting calls on the line. I'm going to get right to them. I've got Tony in Culpeper, California. Welcome to the show, Tony. It's Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek. Hi, Scott. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. You got a qu- question about 3D, and I'm I'm a big 3D fan. So let's go. Well, I love the 3D movies, but how much longer are the theaters going to continue to charge for the glasses? Why can't I just buy a pair of glasses and bring them with me every time and not be charged? Because you can. In this area, they, you can. Well, why not? Well, well, uh, in your area, do, does the theater actually charge something different, uh, an they extra fee for do. the glasses? 
three dollars per use. Wow! And they turn around and recycle them. They clean them up and put them back in bags. Yep. And they keep recycling the whole thing. I want to just have a pair, my own personal pair, just to bring with me. Easy to do. And not have to continue, not have to continue to pay. Sure. Now, is the theater in your area a real D three D theater or is it IMAX? Uh, real D. Real D. You're in luck. Uh, there are a number of companies that sell real D compatible 3D glasses. The one that comes right. to mind is Marchon, M A R C H O N. Right. And uh, yes. you can buy a pair. You can buy clip-ons. In fact, do you wear glasses normally? Prescription glasses. I do. Then, I do. then so do I. And so what you want to do is you want to buy a pair of clip-ons. They look a little geeky, okay. but, but then again, we're geeks after all, aren't we? Not. Right. I think we're we all are. we are all geeks on this bus, and uh, so I don't mind looking geeky. I don't really care how it looks. Some people, you know, with these three D glasses, they go, "Oh, it looks so uncool," and I go, "Who cares? I don't care. I want to look at the movie. I want to see the movie exactly as it's supposed to be." So if you go to a company like Marshawn, Oakley, I think makes them as well. Um, right. You can get three um, D glasses that are compatible with Real D. And right. take them with you to the theater every time. That's the way to go. Okay. In Burbank, I where I live, I uh, they haven't started charging for glasses yet. I'm kind of waiting for them to do that, and I didn't think right. many many places did, but apparently you live in a place that does. Now this won't yeah. work. This won't work for IMAX 3D because IMAX uses no. a different type of polarization. Okay. For 3D, so I I just have to tell you that uh, I like IMAX 3D the best of all 3D because okay. it's brighter because they use two projectors. But okay. they they use a different kind of polarization so those uh three real D 3D glasses won't work there. However, the real D 3D glasses will work with passive 3D TVs from Vizio, LG right. and Toshiba. I have seen those. Yeah. So those same glasses will work exactly for those for any of those TVs if that's what you end up getting for your own home theater if you don't okay. have one already. Cool. I want to throw another question at you. Sure, go for I it. What is your opinion on the uh, first Star Wars movie that came out in 3D? How is George Lucas going to take the original Star Wars from 1977 and bring that into a 3D environment? How is that going to work? Well, he could do it the same way that... Uh, <laughs> I hope he doesn't do it the same way that he did with Episode One, which was very right. poor. Um, I hope he does do it the same way as James Cameron did with Titanic. Now, Titanic was a lot later right. originally, but you can do it with any right. movie. It doesn't matter when it was made. The key is to evaluate, to take a look at each at each scene, each frame, ultimately, which is why it takes so right. long, and evaluate where things are in the frame, in the depth dimension, in the Z-axis, if you will. And, uh, right. And... Uh, and to uh, evaluate, you know, how things are rounded in that axis and so on. And if you take care with that, as James Cameron did, you can get a very effective result. Uh, JVC, right. JVC, just at NAB uh, show last, a couple weeks ago, uh, was showing a system that they have that kind of does some of that automatically, and it seemed to be doing a pretty good job. So maybe we're coming to a point where that's going to be easier to do, but it doesn't matter when the movie was originally made. As long as you take okay. care with how it's done, uh, it can be done well. Now, whether George Lucas will do it right or not uh, is another question. Okay, well, great. Well, All right. for taking your time. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks so much for calling. Bye. Okay, so I got Jay in Providence, North Carolina. Hey, Jay, welcome to the show. Hey, Scott, I'm planning a sound system upgrade at home, and before I commit to doing anything like adding insulation to the walls or getting some kind of bigger low distortion amplifiers, I'm wondering if anything has come along in the last 20 years that I should know about that can help in combating outside noise. By that you mean uh, noise from outside the room coming into the room? Uh, outside the house, like cars and things. Mm, mm -hmm. uh, well, certainly there are plenty of things you can do. It all depends on how much money you want to spend. Um, in fact, uh, yesterday we were talking about the, the problem of when you go to a multiplex and you, you get into a nice quiet scene in a multiplex and then next door they're showing, you know, Clash of the Titans and <clears throat> everything bombastic uh, the subwoofers come through the walls 
Uh, so the commercial cinema space needs to do something about that as well. But you can also do plenty of stuff at home. You need to, uh, <clears throat> well, again, it depends on how much uh, how much you want to spend. Uh, you can. The ideal situation is to build a room within a room. That is to isolate the room completely from the rest of the house. And uh, you would need really an architect and a, and a co- contractor to do that, but that is the best idea. Otherwise, um, you can get various products that do a much better job of insulation than your standard insulation. There's a company called, uh, I think it's called Quiet Quiet Products or something like that. They make they make Quiet Rock, which is sheet rock, insulative sheet rock. Um, also depends on how you build uh, the framing of the room. Are you building this room from scratch? Is that what you're doing? Well, not uh, really, because I'm not, uh, at this point, I don't really want to commit to staying in the house. One minute. What I'm thinking about, and I failed to mention this earlier, is that I've never actually stepped up to Blu-ray, and I'm wondering if things along that line that have come along in the last 20 years, which it's been like 20 years since I've built, put a system together, mm-hmm. I'm wondering if uh, things like that are going to be a better uh, yield per dollar in terms of upping the quality. Well, certainly. If you, if you don't have Blu-ray now... Uh, getting Blu-ray, and it's presumably you'll have a, a high-def TV, uh, TV or projection or some sort of display uh, with a surround sound system and so on. And if you install all of that, you're going to get a just an infinitely better experience than you might have now. And that would certainly be a lot less expensive than trying to build isolation into your um, into your room. Uh, and particularly if you're not going to, if you don't, not sure you're going to stay in the ro- in the house for a long time, I wouldn't necessarily recommend spending the money to, you know, float the room as it's called. But uh, yeah, by all means, upgrade to Blu-ray. No question about that, and it's it's cheap too. This is Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek, sitting in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's Scott Wilkinson here, the television man. Thank you to the chat room for coming up with a suggestion for the bumper music. This is uh, Talking Heads, television man. Into the Beatles. And into the Beatles. Thank you. Would you wind up and walk out on me? Yeah. Kyle Benham spinning the tunes. And last but not least, The Doors. Ah, and of course, we have to end with This is the End. It's the last segment of the day and of the weekend. Thank you to John Slanina for suggesting this. This is the end. Oh. Very nice. Nice mashup. Loquacia says, uh, or rather, Matt uh, W783 says to Kyle Benham, great mashup indeed. A little help from our friends from the chat room. And now we're coming close to the end of a fabulous weekend. I want to thank everybody who uh, has. There it is. Took a little while for the guitar player to get in. Yeah, this is the end. I'm going to take another call here in a second, but I do want to take a moment. To thank Kyle Benham at the board, spinning the tunes, truly a creative master. And uh, Gina Salvati for uh, screening the calls. Thank you so much for that. John Slanina, the studio manager here at Twit, for running the board most of the time, although Greg Burnett's on here right now. And uh, Eli Rosen Duran, the, the um, intern of the decade here at Twit, uh, who's doing a fabulous job helping out wherever he can. And to Leo Laporte, I have to say thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, sit in for you, fill in. Uh, there are awfully big shoes to fill, and uh, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to do it. I just have a blast doing this. As my mentor in the, ra- in the radio world, uh, there is none better. So I thank you, Leo, as you wing your way back home from... The frozen north of Norway, maybe not quite so frozen these days. I hope you got to see the northern lights, the aurora borealis. It's on my bucket list. Uh, It's one of the things I want to do before I make my way out of this world 
is to see that amazing site. So I really hope you got a chance to see it. And even better, if you got a chance to take some pictures, I will look forward to seeing them very, very much. Okay, let's see what else we can get in here. One more call. Uh, Let's go to David in Merced. Hey, David. Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek. How you doing? I'm doing fine, Scott. Thank you for uh, hosting the show this weekend. My pleasure. Um, Got a question here. I've got an old Pioneer Elite uh, VFX 29TX that I'm going to retire. Uh-huh. Nice receiver, by the way. It, it's been it's been very good. The only problem I've ever had has been the DSP board problems with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I'm looking to replace it, uh, of course, with a receiver with HDMI capability. Sure. Uh, power output of the receiver is not critical since I'm driving uh, the speakers with some QSC amps. Oh. Um, but the problem I'm running into is finding receivers that have RCA pre out. Well, have you thought about doing just a, a pre-pro, a preamp processor? Uh, Onkyo, uh, no, I have not. To... Okay, Onkyo and Integra make some some pretty good ones, very good ones, in fact. Um, Emotiva also makes one that I don't think we've reviewed, but I know a lot of people who find Emotiva electronics to be very, very good, and it's a very value-oriented uh, proposition, so... I would suggest, since you already have power amps that you're, you're using to power your speakers, you don't need a receiver which has power amps in it that you're not going to even use. That's correct. That so, does, the, does the preamp stuff have tuner capability? Because it will be playing music also. Well, uh, now, some preamps, uh, I'd, I'd have to go do some research on that, whether they have a radio tuner like AM, FM. A lot of them these days do have Internet access, and they'll bring in Pandora sure. and things like that, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, uh, radio, radio, though, I'm not 100% sure about. Uh, that you'd have to do a little research on. But I really think a pre-pro would be, would be your best bet because you get plenty of HDMI switching, you get all the latest audio formats, um, and you don't have to pay for those uh, power amps in the, in the AV receiver that you're not going to use. Uh, so, so Cal Ray Jr. in the chat room says he would stay with the Onkyo Integra units. Um, Onkyo Integra. Uh, the, uh, okay. Yeah, the on- on- Integra is sort of the high-end brand of Onkyo. It's kind of like Lexus and Toyota, if you know what I mean. Sure. Um, and uh, he, he suggests the 80.3, which I think we just reviewed. Um, and uh, the other option, A6 in the chat room says, is the Marantz AV7005. And I agree with that. I agree with that. That was very highly reviewed. Um, and that's all just a preamp section. It's just a preamp section. What's called a preamp processor. Sure. sure. Um, okay. Or pre-pro. So, yeah, those, those are two recommendations, and I really do suggest that you, uh, that you uh, look at that angle rather than going for another uh, uh, receiver. Good suggestion. Thank you for your help. Okay. Thanks so much for calling. I've uh, got a couple minutes left. I do want to quickly mention that uh, our board op and uh, music maestro, Kyle Benham, is uh, has a little website set up here called adkyle.com, A-D-K-Y-L-E.com. Uh, we are hoping very much to find him some employment in L.A., which will keep him in L.A., and will also keep him running the board for us on the weekends for the tech guy. I sincerely hope that that is successful, and I want to make sure everybody knows so that perhaps somebody might uh, find something for him to do. Let me go one more call here. I think I got enough time for Benny in Pasadena. It's Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek. How you doing? Hi, Scott. Um, This is Benny. Uh, I'm just wondering, are my only options Hulu.com and Netflix for watching television shows on the internet? No, I think not. I think those are the some of the primary ones. Um, but you've also got Vudu, which I think is more movies. But there's still, I think they still have TV, they have some TV shows. I'm gonna check with the chat room here. I bet you they'll be able to tell me. Um, they're gonna they're gonna come in right here for a second and let me know that uh, that there uh, there are some other options. Uh, Hulu is certainly one of the one of the big ones. You can also go to the individual state uh, com- um, stations, uh, broadcasters like ABC or CBS. They'll do a, a lot of streaming directly from their own sites. So that would be another way to go. Um, David Bix in the chat room does say that Vudu has TV shows and at the same price uh, and with as Amazon. And at, there you go. Amazon is another one uh, that has it. 
Um, oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And most likely I'm going to have to pay. I'm going to have to oh, pay yeah. for that food. Amazon. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Now Amazon, if you're, you can become an Amazon Prime member, uh, which gives you access to a lot of content uh, for I think it's seventy, eighty bucks a year. Uh, okay. Something like that. You also get expedited shipping if you order stuff from Amazon. That kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah. That way I can watch my shows like whenever I have time. Yeah, exactly. Stephen Three X in the chat room says Clicker dot com as well. Hey, we've come to the end of a fabulous weekend. I want to thank everybody for joining me. It's Scott Wilkinson, the home theater geek, in for Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Everybody, geek out. Yeah.